Thanks, Oshin. <coughs> and uh, thanks, Emma and Alan. Gr great stuff. Uh, I have to follow all the sales stuff now. So uh, as Henry VIII said to his sixth wife, I won't keep you long. Uh, <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, and welcome to all the lovely people from ATU. I was talking to them earlier. I'm going to talk a little bit about some sales and some marketing, but there's some other stuff in here as well. So we'll, uh, <coughs> we'll rattle along. Uh, I'm a Kilkenny man, and uh, I grew up in a business that was run by my father uh, called the New Park Hotel. Uh, was in our family for like 50 odd years. Um, I, I grew up working in that business as a young fella. Went off to uh, DIT, which is uh, now TU Dublin. You know the way these uh, great institutions keep changing their names to get university status and all that good stuff. But I was in uh, Carl Brew Street and <coughs> I studied business and catering there <coughs> for four years, and uh, then uh, I decided I'd better go and get a job. And uh, I was at a rugby match um, over in, uh, in Edinburgh. And while I'd been in Calibre Street, I worked part-time uh, as a chef in a place called the Peppermint Gardens. It was a very high-end establishment that used to sell things like tacos and guacamole and things that we didn't even know about in those days. This is nearly 40 years ago, by the way. So um, I was over in Edinburgh at a match, uh, as I was yesterday in uh, Rome. Uh, we have to go to and support Irish rugby. So I'm in this bar, and this guy, uh, I was just talking to him, and he says, uh, uh, what do you do? And he, uh, I said to him, what do you do? And he says, I'm the catering manager for uh, ARA Offshore, we do all the catering and all the oil rigs up off Aberdeen. <coughs> and I said, um, he says, uh, what do you do? I said, well, I just finished college. I was working as a chef. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, we're looking for chefs. And I said, well, I'm the best chef that you've never had. And he says, can you start tomorrow? I says, I can. And off I went up to Aberdeen. And I worked up in the rigs then on the North Sea for nearly two years, two weeks of heaven, two weeks of hell. Uh, we worked, uh, I used to work night shift, and uh, that was the school of life because the people that we were serving up there, uh, we used to have to have 14 inch plates, the guys used to eat so much. And um, they were known as bears because they'd just come up and growl at you when they wanted something to eat. Uh, so anyway, I, I decided maybe I better get serious about my career and uh, I got that company transferred me to their operation in Ca in uh, in Canada, and I worked uh, in places like the CNE Stadium in Toronto. I was over there for a couple of years. Went to the States, came back, and I got great experience in. Uh, I was working, as I said, like in stadiums like Croke Park, and we used to do all the catering in the bars. Then I came back, and I ended up getting a job in Bewley's. Uh, which was a different business in those days. Uh, we had 50 shops. Uh, there's only one now, uh, which is a terrible shame, but in my day, there was 50. And uh, I, I, I basically uh, learned my trade in the coffee business uh, in Bewley's. Um, in my time in Bewley's, there were two types of coffee. One was black, the other was white. Take your pick. Uh, and uh, we... we we drove that business, um, and I, I managed. I started. Uh, I started as a, a junior manager in there, and I worked my way up to become the managing director of that business. And that was where I learned about coffee. I learned about retail. I learned about employment. And you know, the business was built up to about uh, thirty odd million in turnover. We had eight hundred staff, um, and as I say, we had. 50 shops, a bakery, a franchising company. And, you know, someone says, what's it like being the managing director of Bewley's, Bobby? And so I'll tell you what it's like. Um, I was at home uh, last Sunday. It was Easter Sunday. And that was in the days when you only didn't really have mobiles. And I got a, a call at home. 
uh, saying, uh, hello, Bobby. I said, who's that? It's Paul, the manager of Bewley's Grafton Street. How are you, Paul? says, I, nice to hear from you on Easter Sunday morning. What's the problem? He says, we, have, we actually have a bit of a problem here, Bobby. There's a fella after robbing an Easter egg. I says, okay. Um, <clears throat> so he says, yeah, well, I, I chased him down Grafton Street. I rugby tackled him at the end of the street. He's back in the shop now, and the guards are here. And I says, Paul, why are you ringing me about this? The guards are here. He says, well, I figured I'd better ring you, Bobby, because it's your problem now, because he had a receipt in his pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so this poor fellow had paid for an Easter egg, <laughs> left the shop, and was brought to the ground by an overzealous manager. Um, thanks very much, Alan. Cheers. And while I laugh at it now, <clears throat> in those days, you know, I was the guy who had to go and see that guy the next day. He was suing us for, for slander, wrong, wrongful arrest, all sorts of things. And, you know, that was a problem that you went and you just sorted it out. So I, I went with a couple of hundred euros in my pocket. I dealt with it. And that was it. We all moved on with our lives. So the moral of that story is that the craziest things that you don't think will happen in business actually do happen. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I, 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 I did my thing in Bewley's. In, I felt that it was maybe time to go on and do something else. And I was very fortunate in the late 90s uh, to be working in a coffee business when this whole coffee evolution was starting. And I, I'd been to the States. Uh, I had watched what was going on over there. I, I was looking at what had happened in the UK, particularly in London. And all these coffee shops were opening up. And I thought maybe if I could do something, because just going back to Bewley's in Grafton Street, which is still there, in the late 90s, when I was the managing director there, the rent on that building was, I think it was just short of 300,000 which was a lot of money then. The rent on that building today is 1.8 million. So what was happening was that every five years, the rents would double. Uh, and, you know, it, it meant that after three rent reviews, effectively, you were out of business because you, you started working for the landlord. Then you couldn't even do that. And uh, it became impossible to make them profitable. So that was essentially what you know, the demise of Bewley's, the retail arm of Bewley's, was largely around the property thing. So I thought maybe if I could, you know, take my knowledge of coffee, bring it to a smaller place. The other thing that never happened in the 90s was you never saw anybody walking down the street with a coffee. There was no takeout business per se. And that's hard to imagine now. But no one, they used to have these horrible white polystyrene cups that no one would drink out of. So that business didn't exist. And my thinking was that if I could open a shop <clears throat> on a much smaller footprint, that people would take the coffee away and take the sandwiches away, and only some of them would dwell on the premises that I might just have something. So I set up my first business in Grafton Street in the basement of Laura Ashley. It was called Perk originally. And uh, it basically... So it, it basically was, um, we opened up Perk. I built it to five shops. I opened one in Grafton Street, Baggett Street, Dawson Street, and then I got really lucky. I won a tender, and I was just listening to the sales talk here this morning. The UCD went out for tender for, for a coffee shop, uh, and I went up to pitch for the business. And... I remember seeing two other coffee shops. They were all, we were all waiting outside. And one of the other companies brought a sample of coffee in a flask, like, uh, you know, like, just not unlike, the, not, and no disrespect to the coffee over there, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the coffee in the flask was effectively what they went in and sold their pitch on. Um, and uh, 
again, I asked afterwards why uh, I got the business and they didn't. And, and the reason that I got the business was I told them how great our coffee was and they didn't get to taste it. But the other company brought in a bad coffee and basically said, this is what we will be get serving you and the students. And sorry, lads, that ain't good enough. And we, we opened our fourth shop up in UCD and then we got a second one up there on the other because it was going so well. And that was a turning point of the business. So effectively then, I had six shops and Insomnia was a competitor of mine. It was set up by other people. Uh, they had seven shops and there was another company called Bendini and Shaw, which was a sandwich business. They had five shops. And effectively, we brought the three shops together, rebranded them all Insomnia, and we had 17 shops and off we went. And the difference between me and I remember thinking, I've got six shops here, I'm barely making a living, I was working seven days a week, I had a route that brought me around the five shops every day, I had no managers, no structures, and everything was me. And I realized that I said that I'm always gonna have five shops if I continue to run the business this way. And I reckoned that um, if I could actually, you know, basically combine with somebody who had, who, had, who had greater resources and greater skills than me, that I'd be much better off with 50% of something that had a potential to grow. And we did grow that business. We grew it significantly. And one of the successes of Insomnia was, was largely built around partnerships. And I'm, Partnerships are hugely important in business. The first partnership that we had was, I was in partnership with two other guys. We're still uh, friends. I still actually do, even though I sold my interest in, in Insomnia in 2018, I'm still uh, very much friendly and I still work uh, occasionally even to this day with Insomnia. So that partnership was three of us. We all did different things. We all brought different things to the party. And we knew what one, one was good at, which maybe somebody else wasn't. The second partnership was around the businesses that we worked with. Um, Spar in particular, we did a deal with Spar back in the early days uh, where we basically opened up within Spars with two models. Uh, we had the franchise model within uh, with, within a store where there's barista coffee, and then we had the bean to cup machines, which there are now over 500 of those. And those partnerships with Eason's, with Pennies, with all those people who had much deeper pockets than us, allowed us to grow and to grow significantly. So like it all stops, it all starts, you know, with one shop. And then, you know, you work towards building the scale of the business, and, you know, we made, a, we made mistakes, but uh, one of the things that we did was with those partnerships, we ended up with high street shops, concession businesses, such as Pennies and Easton's and that, and then our franchise model in Spar. So that we were never in, we, we had three different income streams. And effectively, if you can create three different income streams, you'll always have one that's strong, one that's maybe not going so well, and one part of the business can carry the other part. And that was sort of how we did that. Um, the consistency, the name on the brand, Insomnia, again, we never, the Cup with Wings, it's been around since 1996. Um, the first Insomnia actually was here in Galway, would you believe? Um, and it was in the, in, the old, in the old shopping center. And again, it was, a business that uh, it was in a bookshop as well because uh, Derek Hughes had been one of the original founders. And uh, that logo, if you take away the name Insomnia, we had some research done which said that the, basically the recognition factor, uh, it has a 96% recognition factor uh, basically with, with in Ireland, which is really, really high. So it, has become a national brand um, and you only become a brand because of being consistent of where you are. 
uh, opening all the shops on the high street. The only reason that insomnia was relevant in Spar was because uh, we were opening shops on the high street. And, you know, th that's, you know, you might open a shop that isn't really making a huge amount of money. It might be breaking even, but it's in the right place. It's doing the right thing. It's making the right statement and it's, it's selling uh, a consistent product. Um, when I look at the employees in Insomnia, and again, it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful to think that all those people that work there now, back in the late 90s, we had no, all, we had all Irish people and we used to try and run the business on part-time students, which is what you did, because they were the only people who were available to work for us. Then in the early 2000s, we had the big influx of people who aren't from Ireland, to the point that in 2007 and 8, uh, we had like four or 500 staff, and there was only five people that were Irish in the business, believe it or not. And then it, it changed again. Uh, a lot of the people uh, from Eastern Europe, from Brazil, from all the other countries, uh, left and went back to where they're from. But the core of the insomnia staff now is still two thirds of the people aren't from Ireland. And most of the managers in all the shops, the area managers, are all people who came with us back in those early days and they're still with the business. And that makes me immensely proud. Um, the branding is really about the imagery, the consistency, like we used to tell our staff that you only really need to do two things in our business. And you talked, Emma talked about simplicity. I'm a huge believer in simplicity. We reckon that the only thing that we focused on around training was making the perfect cup of coffee and giving good, excellent customer service. And that was what we focused all our training on. We set up an academy in the back of our shop in Rat Mines. We used to do all the coffee training and all that. And we used to get all the products delivered through, in, through the night, give the keys of the shops to all the van drivers so that when the managers came in in the morning, the shop, shop was fully stocked, ready to go. So really to allow them do what they were good at, incentivize the managers as well, that they got a share of the profits uh, from each shop and just keeping things very simple, but allowing people have the responsibility to ru run their own shop within the context of a brand. Uh, as I said, we made mistakes. We learned lots of lessons. Uh, we, we opened and closed shops. When, you know, when you've got a portfolio of two or 300 cafes, there's always going to be 10 or 15 dogs. That's just the way it works. Uh, you're never going to get them all right, but as long as you can keep your ratios right and get much more uh, right than wrong, that's it. That's what you got to do. And if one shop fails, you just don't, you try not to lose heart. Uh, you just pick yourself up again and hopefully the next one you open is successful. That's always my philosophy. Um, just wanted to bring you back to this slide because this is a slide that I had in 2008 when things were really, really bad. And we were looking down the eye of a, of the eye of a gun because we were, we were, we were, uh, we were customers of Bank of Scotland at the time. Uh, they were, we were totally indebted. Um, we were in all these high street shops, and all of a sudden the lights went out. Uh, we had this massive uh, recession, and the only show in town was value. So, if you took um, like a typical coffee and a muffin, um, if you were buying them individually, uh, they might cost you. Uh, 450, uh, near almost five euros, the coffee and the muffin. We decided to come up with these bundles where if you bought two things and we reduced the price by 28%, which was really, really risky. And within three months of these three promotions coming up, we had 60% of all the sales were in one of these categories. So what we did was we actually brought down the average spend which was, you know, you say, why would you do that? But we kept enough people coming over the door because we were absolutely given 
real value. And people saw it as real value. It wasn't a gimmick. It was, we had to reorganize ourselves completely to try and keep our margins. We had to close a sandwich making factory. We had to take vans off the road. We had to do all sorts of things. But we did it, and it was one of the reasons we survived. And I'm wondering, you know what? People don't really talk about value anymore. People don't, you know, everybody just, like, I, I think we're coming back to the era of, you know, where you need to look at being competitive, lowering your costs, uh, offering real value, rewarding loyalty. We brought in technology back in those days uh, with, with, the, with the loyalty cards that was allowed us to identify who our loyal customers were. So if somebody was in, say, in Grafton Street or Baggett Street during the week, they might be in Malahide or in Hoth at the weekend, and we were able to track the people who spent most with us, and then we were able to focus in on them in terms of offering them promotions and offering them, you know, uh, basically better terms. Um, <coughs> so, just to talk about sales for a second, and again, just having listened to what I heard earlier this morning, um, I, I have again a, a simple philosophy about sales. The first one is that I don't buy off anybody I don't like. So, if I don't like you, or if you come in to sell me something and you behave in a way that makes you unlikable, I will not buy off you. And I say that not in an arrogant way, but I really think that if you strip it back to likability, if you, if you strip it back to reading the room, you know, maybe doing your research before you go, but behaving in a way that the people on the other side of the table actually end up liking you. And it's not a, an insincere like, it's not about putting on a show, but I just think if you're yourself, you bring the energy, you do all the things you should do, you have your product knowledge, uh, you know what you're selling, you listen to what's been, uh, you listen to, uh, to, to the potential customer, you find out what they want, and then you provide a solution for them. Um, and you know, I, there's often things in a, in, a, in a, when you first meet somebody, first impressions, I, I, Alan mentioned it there about being in the, in the car park and the fella, uh, seeing him changing in his van or whatever it was. But first impressions are hugely important. And I'm a big first impressions person as well. One of the things that I always, I'm not brilliant at everything, but I was always perceptive of about uh, having a sixth sense about people. Uh, sure, I got hires wrong, but I got, I got a lot more right than I got wrong on the basis that I, 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 you have to be streetwise, you have to be observant, you have to be listening, you have to be looking and learning. And just going in with your, with your eyes open, going in with maybe your mouth slightly closed and your ears open so that you're listening. But definitely, de definitely for me, likability is hugely important. And the other thing then is, you know, after that meeting, when you're fortunate enough to get a meeting, to pitch whatever it is your product or service is, what do you do afterwards? Because that's, that's another big piece of where a sale is won and lost. And maybe, maybe the guy in the room doesn't want to buy just today. Maybe he wants to buy, maybe he's got to see other people. Maybe he wants to, so again, you read the room and you say, but how did you follow up? Did you come back? Did you do what you said you'd do? Uh, were you true to yourself? So, so to me, sales isn't complicated. It's about knowing what it is you're selling, arriving with enthusiasm and energy, to being yourself, being likable, and following up on what it is that you do. All very simple. And I, I don't think that disagrees with anything that's, that Emma told us earlier. It, it may be slightly, but I, I think it's along the same lines. A um, <clears throat> couple of other things I want to tell you. Marketing, right? Now, I, I know there's some sales and marketing students here in the room, so 
Uh, I'm sorry I disappointed earlier about being a celebrity, but there's a, there's, <laughs> there's a celebrity here called Miley Cyrus there on the right-hand side of the page. And when she came to Dublin, she very kindly uh, went into Insomnia in Grafton Street, and that picture was on the front page uh, of every newspaper. It was on websites all over the world. Yippee, says us. Uh, <clears throat> then in the, pi the picture on the left was in 2009, I believe it was, November, when we lost our sovereignty and the IMF came to town to tell us that we were bust. As a nation, we were broke. And there's a poor beggar man. Uh, he used to be there at the top of Dawson Street and Stevens Green. Uh, I haven't seen him actually in a while, but I used to see him a lot. And he was there with his, God love him, with his insomnia cup, trying to get his few quid. And Mr. Chopra and the IMF walk across town. Front page of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Irish Times, and the Insomnia Cup is right in there in the middle of it. Um, best advertising, even though it was a dark day that we could ever got. But what happened next? And this is where the tabloids get very clever. They took poor old Brian Cowan's head <laughs> and they superimposed it on the beggar man at the top of the street with the IMF coming to town. <coughs> and the Insomnia Cup is still there. So the moral of the story is that the best marketing is free. You don't have to spend too much money. Get out there with your business. Get yourself noticed. If you take this guy here, he's in the plumbing and heating business. Um, if you saw him par stopped at the traffic lights, you might just say, you know what? Uh, I remember that guy because he spent 500 euros on his van. And then the next time your toilet is blocked, I saw that guy. So what I'm trying to tell you here is, this is not big money strategy. This is not marketing campaigns. This is using your loaf to get out there and get noticed. And, and I think it was Alan said it earlier, you know, get yourself noticed, make it memorable. Uh, you often see people at trade shows doing something on their stand that might be slightly different. They might have a goldfish in a bowl or they do something that just makes them stand out. And like ev that, as a small business, you need to stand out and you need to, you need to be memorable. So that's the same with, in sales. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk to you just about two other quick things. One thing is your health is your wealth. And uh, in 2015, business was going gangbusters. Uh, life's great. Mary and my four daughters, all fantastic. Um, and I feel this small lump here on the side of my neck. And one of my girls told me, you've got to go to the doctor with that dad. I said, ah, yeah, it's grand. And then eventually I went, and the guy says, oh, yeah, well, should we just take a bit of a biopsy there and we'll see. I'm sure it's nothing, but it's grand. And then you get a phone call saying you need to come in and see me. And then I go in and the guy says, well, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Kerr, you've got head and neck cancer. And I said, oh, my God. And I then, you know, I got very, very sick in, in 2015. I didn't think I was going to come out the other side of it. And I remember back in those dark days, lying in a bed up in St. Luke's in Ratgar and thinking that really, you know what, for all my success and perceived success in, you know, in business and in life, I really, there's only three things that now matter to me and they are my health, so I had to get myself better, my friends and all the people uh, that I, I met along the way and my family. And all the other stuff is bullshit. So if you can live your life where those are the only three things that matter, I think you'll be in a good place. And that's what I decided then. Now, I was always a liver of life. I was always very active. I'm still, uh, I'm meant to be retired, but I seem to be getting uh, busier every day. But those three things, if you learn nothing else here today, 
Just remember that, that they're the things that actually matter in life. And all the stuff that you do should really bring yourself, and whatever it is you do, should have those three things in mind. So I'm, I'm well now, and as I said to a fellow last week, when I die, I want to come back as myself, um, because life truly is for living. Um, I also decided back then that, you know, really, I was always active. I played a lot of rugby. I used to sail. I still sail. Uh, and, but I took up running after I got sick. And there is a big link between your business health and your personal health. So, you know, I, you, 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 need, you need to do, find something outside business that keeps you active, that gets you out there. And I do really, really believe that your mind is sharper if you're fit. I run two or three times a week. I cycle a bit, and I do all this, not, not for the love of it, but because of the mental peace. Uh, I really feel great after doing it. And I feel sharp, and I feel I have energy. I've got, I'm observant, and I'm, I'm ready for the next thing. So, not to preach, but find something that you like doing that gets you out there, whether it's going for a walk, climbing a mountain, jumping a lake, as Christy Moore said, whatever it is, but go and do something uh, and have another interest outside your business because it's well worth doing. And that last point there, making your fitness your work, that's about putting a run into your diary. If, if, you, if you put your exercise into the business side of your, your week rather than the leisure side, you, it's just like having an appointment. You won't let somebody down, you'll go and do it. So that's what I do. Last, I want to give you my life tips. And these are uh, basically uh, not business tips, but life tips. I'll just go through them briefly, if I may. Forget the begrudgers. Uh, stop listening to Joe Duffy. <laughs> Listen to me on Saturday morning. I now have 120,000 listeners, and we, we only do positivity. Uh, we don't do debt equity ratios. We don't do, uh, uh, you know, we don't do high stocks and shares stuff. We do business for every man. Uh, the man or the girl with the van, uh, but, but everyday business. Um, I also uh, have a new podcast, as everybody has a podcast now, but... I did one on uh, life and leadership, um, and uh, Galway's Pat McDonough was on last week. Rosanna Davidson is this week. Bernard Brogan is next week. And I went to their location, what, what inspired them. And uh, so whether it was up in a GAA ground or Pat McDonough brought me to the plaza in Loch Ray, that was where he wanted to uh, talk about his journey. But anyway... So number two is enjoy what you do. And I don't say that flippantly. If you, don't, if you find yourself in a job that you're not enjoying, engineer your way out of it. Go and do something else. Study at night. Get a part-time job. But don't stay somewhere that you're miserable. Because, you know, life is too short. And enjoying our work is so much part of our overall life. So... If you find, and you will find something that you'll enjoy doing, whatever it is, but don't stay somewhere you're miserable. Number three should be number one. We talked about it already. It's health, friends, and family. Number four, embrace technology. You know, I, I, I struggle with, 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 with the social media stuff, but I, I, I work, I, I educate myself to try and at least uh, be at the races so that I don't get left behind. And we do have to get out of our comfort zones and do stuff that we're maybe not naturally good at just to stay relevant. So you have to embrace technology. Otherwise, you, you, it'll, it'll kill you. Surround yourself with positive people. And just like positive people are infectious, so are negative people. And I always had a thing, if somebody doesn't buy into the dream Somebody doesn't want to be there, get them off the stage. Only work with people um, that have <clears throat> a positive disposition. Number six is about setting goals and targets for yourselves. 
So every December, you write five or six things down on the back of a page, even on the back of a fag box. You look at them once a month for the next 12 months, and if you write down six things, I guarantee you you'll get four of them done uh, the following year. And they don't all have to be business things. It might be about getting fit. It might be about something else you want to do. But write something down somewhere in terms of what you want to do. Integrity is huge with me. Uh, your reputation is earned. Um, I've been in business now for 40 years. Never do anything that, that, that will damage your reputation, whatever that might be. You, you work so hard uh, to, to build it up, uh, and reputation, as I say, is absolutely sacrosanct. So don't do something stupid on the basis that it will absolutely, that you'll regret. And I've seen many people do things for really small gain. You wonder why they do it, and their whole world just comes tumbling down. Innovate constantly, and innovation isn't always about new things or new products. It can be about looking at your business in a different way, taking cost out, making things more efficient. Um, network, as you're doing here today, it's a lovely morning, out bright and early, you meet people, you get out there, you're learning, you're interacting. Go and do more of it, it's well worth doing. And then, back to the old GA stuff, uh, like the cats play to win, but that doesn't always work out. So uh, uh, thanks very much for listening to me this morning. That's all I got to tell you. Uh, it's been great to be with you. I'll talk to you all again soon. <laughs>